Hi, I'm Gary Sticks. I'm an editor at Scientific American, and I'm here with uh, Li Wei Tsai, who is the director of the Picawar Institute for Learning and Memory uh, and the Picawar Professor of Neuroscience uh, in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT. And uh, she's also a senior associate member of the Broad Institute. And um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about her work. And I would like um, Li Wei, if possible, sure. to talk a little bit about the whole Alzheimer's field, which um, is uh, a focus of a lot of your work, and um, the current state of the Alzheimer's field. The, the, there are enormous numbers of drugs. I always hear about 99 point something that uh, just have failed. And there, I think there's a real worry in the field that there's no clear directions forward. And your work approaches some of the problems uh, of the biology of Alzheimer's in, 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 new, in new ways. So Thank if you. you could talk a little bit about what you think that problem is. And then from there, we can go on and talk about uh, some of the work that you presented today at the conference and um, some, of you, some of your hopes for that work. Sure. Um, so I think everybody knows about Alzheimer's disease, and everybody is um, afraid of Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. I've talked to people who said they would rather have cancer than having Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. because in the late stage of Alzheimer's disease, people de develop dementia um, and they need full-time care. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they don't remember, they forget who they are. They, they forget their loved ones and their close friends. Um, and they, you know, they also lose their, their dignity. Um, unfortunately, the reality is that the society is aging and Alzheimer's disease is an age-dependent neurodegenerative disease. So, um, so, so in the next two to three decades, the number of Alzheimer's uh, patients is likely to double. Mm -hmm. And That's about 10 or 11 million people? Yeah, right now it's about 5.4, 5.5 million people in mm -hmm. the U.S. Worldwide, um, hard to estimate, but probably 45 million people, mm -hmm. probably an underestimation actually. A lot of people go undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. So um, when it comes to therapeutics, um, we have a few drugs approved by the FDA. Mm -hmm. Um, and they are so-called uh, symptomatic modifying drugs, mm -hmm. symptom modifying drugs. Um, they alleviate the symptom temporarily. Um, they don't really um, revert uh, the disease, mm -hmm. um, certainly not even close to cure the disease. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, there is a lot of effort in the pharmaceutical industry to come up with better and more effective drugs. Mm -hmm. But we all know uh, there have been a lot of high profile uh, failure mm -hmm. of um, late stage clinical trials, mm -hmm. uh, numerous. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the drugs have focused on amyloid and in some way removing amyloid. And so far, uh, there's still some hope for that, but yes. uh, th these drugs that go in and are antibodies that remove the amyloid, so far there has been no clear success. So I think there is the notion that um, amyloid accumulation in the brain happens uh, very early on mm -hmm. in the course of the disease. Um, it takes, you know, right now the notion is that probably a couple of decades mm -hmm for the amyloid to build up. Mm -hmm. and, um, and during this period, um, you know, there is this long time of so-called asymptomatic stage or pre-symptomatic stage. Um, so the, 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 all the trials um, so far have been conducted in uh, patients with um, 
uh, moderate or, mm -hmm. you know, Alzheimer's disease or even mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. So there's and a feeling it might be too they interesting. They all fail. So the feeling right now is that uh, once the patients um, start to show symptoms, it's probably too late. Mm -hmm. um, so the effort in the industry right now is to identify um, people who are, are in the very, very early stage or who don't show very noticeable uh, symptoms yet mm -hmm. to target them. Um, but it's still not clear yet whether removing amyloid is going to be useful therapeutically. In humans, no. Yeah, yeah we don't know. Okay. So um, you have looked at uh, some new ways uh, of modulating both amyloid and um, attacking Alzheimer's in other ways. So the talk that you gave today was looking at a non-invasive therapy, no drugs, that might um, have an effect on amyloid and perhaps some of the other signs of Alzheimer's like the tau protein. Yes. So why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so, you know, when I look at Alzheimer's disease, you know, obviously there have been decades of work. People look at molecules mm -hmm. and pathology and mm -hmm. protein, ag abnormal protein aggregation and, and genes. Mm -hmm. You know, today many, many genes have been identified to associate with Alzheimer's disease. There are several disease-causing genes, and then there are now, you know, two to three dozens of so-called risk genes um, that can increase the risk for people to develop Alzheimer's. So, so we know a lot, I would say, about genes and molecules. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the brain mm -hmm. and how the molecules and genes and proteins mm -hmm. interact with the activity mm -hmm. um, of the brain cells mm -hmm. is it really we still ha don't have um, much information at mm -hmm. all. You know, you know the brain, the fundamental um, character of our brain is um, uh, connectivity. Mm -hmm. You know, neurons form these um, trillions of synapses, mm -hmm. so they can communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. And they have there are many different forms of um, um, uh, connectivity and population dynamics, and and um, and how information gets processed. Um, so that you know, we can all very rapidly, when we see something, we can process that information. When we hear something, we can process that, and then you know, the information gets processed. So, so you know, this morning we also heard uh, speakers and last night talking about decision making. So we mm -hmm. take that information from our sensory system, mm -hmm. and then we got to quickly make a decision about mm -hmm. what to do. And you know, obviously, Alzheimer's disease patients are very impaired. Mm -hmm. in all of these functions, mm -hmm. but we absolutely have no clue, mm -hmm. right? How, you know, their brain network, their brain circuitry mm -hmm. is affected. So I sort of feel it's a very important area mm -hmm. for us to look at. You know, perhaps, um, you know, the etiology and the pathophysiology of the disease, mm -hmm. you know, involve not just genes and molecules, but probably, you know, neuronal activity and mm -hmm. circuit uh, dynamics itself. Mm -hmm. so, and you're really interested in circuit dynamics, right? Absolutely. Circuit, yeah. I think that's just very fundamental part, you know, character of our brain. Our brain basically is a computer. Mm -hmm. It's a circuit board. Right. <laughs> it's just a very powerful one. Yeah. And so in the last two years or so, you've come across uh, a new technology that seems to uh, on a very simple level, clean out some of those circuits. And it's not focused so much on amyloid or tau or anything, but it seems to have an effect on circuit function, right? Right, so, you know, so we, we started to look into, you know, um, uh, the oscillatory neural activity. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it's a very fundamental type of brain activity. So our brain can fire uh, oscillations or, you know, people call them brain waves mm -hmm. as well, ma at many different frequencies. And uh, low frequency brain waves, um, you know, are more active during like 
sleep state, mm -hmm. you know, and and then di di different frequencies of um, oscillations, and um, and one of these um, uh, waves known as uh, the gamma mm -hmm. oscillations. It's very um, fast, right? It's it's kind of intermediate level. Okay. I mean, it's um, you know it ranges from about thirty to eighty hertz. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, it, it's it's on the more higher sort of side, and uh, higher frequent, so faster side, and um, and and the gamma band frequency is um, um, historically known to to be more active when animals are or human subjects are more actively engaged in you know active sort of um, tasks, mm -hmm. you know, like you know. Um, you know, working memory and and um, um, navigation, and you know, people like to make example like, you know, when you need to meet the deadline, your brain is firing gamma oscillations right. very very actively. So, but these are a lot of the deficits that you find in Alzheimer's. Too, exactly. Right? So yeah. we found that this uh, gamma band frequency oscillation is um, impaired, mm -hmm. you know, in very early on in the course of Alzheimer's disease. And, and we, of course, initially did this um, in animal Even models. Even before people are aware of it sometimes, for, you know, so that it's so, sub subclinical? Yes. So okay. in the animal models, we, we found oscillation deficits, you know, before the animals show any behavioral mm -hmm. abnormalities. And I think other group also show the same, mm -hmm. similar results. Um, so that just got my attention mm -hmm. because... Was this related to any of the work? There's a lot of interest now in epileptic activity. In fact, there is a clinical trial going on with levetiracetam, yes. the epileptic, it's, but it's different than what you're doing. They're treating this, you know, th th these um, low-level seizures. You're actually modulating in some way. They so they are modulating too. Okay. So I think in the end, you know, I think their initial study I actually cited in my talk today. Okay. They show that this um, fast spiking interneurons, mm -hmm. known as the PV positive interneurons, right. um, their synaptic function is abnormal mm -hmm. in, in their model. Right. And, and also their models show significantly reduced gamma oscillations, mm -hmm. 40 hertz gamma oscillations. And these animals show this epileptic form mm -hmm. of these charges. Right. Okay. So, so this is all related. Yeah. So when your gamma oscillations is not um, functional, right. then it cannot control the f spiking of this uh, excitatory neuron. So you start to see this kind of you know disorganized. Uh, spiking patterns. Of so how did you come up with the idea of using LEDs to modulate some of this activity? I, I mean, light can modulate uh, certain epileptic reactions. Uh, did that have anything to do with it? So um, this is a very good question because I got asked a lot. I got asked a lot because when I show this LED light flicker, um, well, explain can induce what, what gamma the, oscillations. Yeah. Um, you know, but then, you know, people will ask me, oh, have you ever watched this, this you know, episode of a Japanese animation <laughs> called um, Naruto? Uh, I said, what are you talking about? And then they say, you know, there's this strobe light uh, presented in that episode and a lot of kids they watch it and then they got epileptic yeah. uh, kind of uh, uh, reaction yeah. and so I said oh so do you know what is the frequency of that uh, yeah. strobe light yeah. and you know it's like um, 12 hertz or 14 hertz or something yeah. like that so yes I think that there, there are reports of um, epilepsy induced by uh, flicker, but that's, that's Very different low frequency, frequency yeah. uh, light flicker. Um, I think anything about 30 hertz, um, I haven't heard of this kind of frequency right. would, would, would induce seizure light right. activity. Yeah. So why don't you describe how you got to the idea of uh, using LEDs from your research, from your basic research, to actually applying it in an animal model. So to be to be honest, you know, so we initially we were very happy just doing optogenetics, you know, okay. so there's wonderful results, and 
And then that's, but when, when I presented this data to my colleagues mm -hmm. at the PICOR Institute, mm -hmm. um, and one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Emery Brown, yeah. who is actually a physician. Yeah, he's an okay. anesthesiologist. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. And then he said, these results are wonderful, but do you know optogenetics is not going to be applied to humans, not in the next 10 years. Yeah. Um, You've got to think of a way to do it non-invasively. Yeah. Okay? So he was very nice. And he um, and his postdoc um, brainstormed with me and my former graduate student mm -hmm. um, over many, many meetings. Mm -hmm. And then um, and we started to um, um, really seriously think about the possibility of sensory stimulation because you know there are reports that sensory stimuli can induce gamma oscillations mm -hmm. um, so um, so so you know but it, it, back then you know before we ever done the first experiment you know I mean looking at the literature we don't really know whether how believable it is and you know uh, whether it's likely to work in a small mouse because most of mm -hmm. those experiments were were done in you know bigger larger uh, mammals so um, so eventually we said okay you know it, it requires some engineering you know um, some programming and, and stuff like that so so we eventually decided okay why don't we give it a shot so uh, so so <laughs> but we, you weren't necessarily over optimistic no, about no, it. not at all I, yeah. I really didn't think it would work so you know we, we treated it like you know like a sort of like a fun thing to do so my student actually just ordered some LED light strip from like uh, Google because we were shopping for the <laughs> cheapest LED we can find so 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 you know we got this less than ten dollars this uh, big bunch of uh, LED uh, light strip and um, and Hannah you know she she has some computer science background she, she can write some code so so um, so we started from there and we really didn't treat it that seriously at all um, but then, you know, I mean, when we saw this entrainment in the visual cortex, we, we realized, hmm, this is actually I, probably real. I, I mean, the previous story. publications. Didn't Hannah <laughs> run in and say, after the animals had been exposed to the LED light, that the amyloid was gone or had was, was starting? It was drastically reduced. It was and drastically reduced. Like, I don't know. I don't. Do I believe this data? I mean, we. We, 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 we were very stressed out for a long time because, you know, we, we don't know what to believe it. It's, it's, it's just, um, you know, something that you don't, you don't really believe. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people will say, oh, this is too good to be true. Um, so, um, so we actually... Um, but you're had, a long um, way from there. You've, the, you're, we, we, you, we, you, we, 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 let me tell you to, to what extent we, uh, we were very skeptical about the result. We, um, not only that, Hannah um, had to go back and repeat it many times. So we, we actually had other people uh, never done this kind of experiment before, and other people um, totally working on different projects to 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 reproduce it. So mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I, before it was published. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, so you know, and turn out that's one of the most robust phenotype you can you can measure. You know, reduction of amyloids. Like. So, at this point, you have found reduction of amyloid in the visual cortex, which right. makes sense because that's what's being stimulated, and you're looking at other areas as well, right? I no, mean, we started to look at other areas. Obviously, you know, reduction of amyloid in the visual cortex. You know, in the whole scheme of Alzheimer's disease, it's like you it's want not the very CA, meaningful, CA1 right? One hippocampus. It's, it's, it's visual cortex is a sensory part of the brain. In fact, visual cortex is very important, but um, you know, yeah. uh, people don't give it enough credit. But uh, that's but an early <laughs> sign of Alzheimer's too. That visual exactly. problems or um, all kinds of sensory problems. You yeah, know, right now there is. I think there is a potential diagnostic. Yeah. Um, Smell, vision. I don't know about hearing, but but perhaps. the amyloid in the retina. Yeah. Yeah, people can just you know directly uh, image it rather than using this very uh, sophisticated. Um, amyloid uh, uh, pad imaging. But the question remains whether it does have, say, 
an impact on the hippocampus, which is the area that deals with memory. We, absolutely, I think that's a very important So you're question. looking at that? Yeah. 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 But I mean, this is developed, we have to stop uh, very soon, but um, this has developed a lot of excitement, even in the public, right? There are, you have people calling you? Calling me, emailing me, everybody, and a lot of people say, oh, you know, I know you still have to do clinical trial, but you know, my mother cannot wait, so we just just create a homemade device and you know present present it to my mother or my grandfather. I mean, I I really got a lot of messages from people um, all over the country and all over the world. Yeah. So, th this has become a big priority for you, t finding out what's really going on, and what the potential. Um, uh, impact could be in humans. You're, you're starting to look very slowly at what uh, the reaction might be in humans, right? I mean, so uh, at MIT, yes, yeah. we um, started a small uh, trials. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't call it trial study, human study. So we start off with. Um, healthy young people, mm -hmm. just to see in the healthy state um, how much uh, gamma entrainment we can get from the LED light mm -hmm. um, exposure. And then um, the next step we're going to do is to do it in um, aged um, mm -hmm. people, but still cognitively normal. Uh, because, you know, I mean, I think, it, it, you know, Dr. Brown, Emery Brown, um, you know, he he has established that, you know, the the robustness of oscillation um, inversely correlates with brain aging. Mm -hmm. So um, so just look at the strength of oscillation. He said mm -hmm. he can predict mm -hmm. how cognitively normal uh, the person is. So so definitely, even healthy aging will cause, will lead to decreased um, gamma oscillations in the brain. Um, so, so we're going to see how aged people can be entrained to increase their gamma oscillations. And then we're going to, based on the data, what we have, hope to do is to be able to further optimize mm -hmm. um, the protocol. Um, before we um, try it on um, people with Alzheimer's disease. So the stage that it's at now, just to wrap up, is that you're continuing with the basic research. You still need more basic research. Plus, Absolutely. Plus, you're very early translational stage. Very early, but I think basic research is the key because the more you understand it, the more you understand the mechanism. Right, the and more you still you need know. to understand more about the mechanism. Yeah. How to do it, yeah. Right, well, let's hope that next time that we're talking, um, you have progress to report, and good luck with everything. Thank you very much. Sure.